Many of you will know uh, David, he's spoken here before, um, but he also uh, spoke at our first uh, weekend away. Should be quite an energetic talk because he's a fitness instructor as well, so uh, make sure you stay wide awake because he might suddenly get you up doing something. I say that, it keeps everybody awake and it'll get them listening to you. Let's just pray for David. Lord God, thank you uh, for your servant David. Thank you for the gifts that you've given him. And as he opens your word to us this morning, we pray that we will have fresh insight that we would be challenged by what you say through him this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lee. And uh, thank you, everyone, for the welcome um, and uh, for the opportunity to, to be here this morning. Uh, although I guess most of you didn't get much choice, did you, really? But uh, here we are. Um, I haven't... I don't do a lot of um, speaking in churches, so this is uh, quite uh, exciting. As uh, Lee indicated, I, I do more sort of try, trying to get people to uh, move from where they are at the moment to somewhere else, which is usually from, you know, off the couch onto some kind of uh, activity of some sort. Um, but it's all in the business of change, isn't it? So uh, um, I think it's still an element of discipleship in there somewhere. Um, Discipline, anyway. Hey. Before I came this morning, I, obviously I've had a bit of time to think about this and say, Lord, it's been a while since I was with this particular group of followers uh, of Jesus, and there might be something that you specifically would want to say to this group, and it seems like a, a very key moment with new vicar and uh, family joining you, or having joined you just now. And so I submit this with great humility, I don't want to sort of uh, throw a spanner in the works here, but just something I think to encourage you before I get into the things that I wanted to, to say from the scripture passages that we've been looking at. And uh, sometimes when I'm praying, I get this sort of impression, you know, and I, I like to sort of describe it, so that's what I'm going to do. I kind of looked at Christchurch Bushmead a, a little bit like a big inflatable raft, okay? Um, going down some white water um, with quite a lot of people on board, careering down the stream. Uh, and in the boat, there were uh, mixed emotions. <laughs> some were a little anxious, some borderline terrified, um, some excited and thrilled, um, some quite passive, you know, just along for the ride. One or two in the water <laughs> with their life jackets on here and there too. And then there were three or four in the boat with paddles trying to steer and maneuver the raft away from rocks and away from dangers and so on. But importantly, everybody was in the flow. You're in it together. Um, there was quite a lot of animated discussion about which way to steer. The paddling seemed to be sometimes synchronized and worked well like a team, but uh, sometimes a bit panicky and a bit ineffective with a dab here and a dab here, uh, if you know what I mean. The crew with the paddles have the care of the occupants of the raft very much on their hearts and are reaching out with every effort to those in the water. They're doing the best they can and need the encouragement and collaboration of everyone. The river is strong, and the raft is being carried along. So it's all going in the right direction. Mostly, the crew are watchful and eager and responding to the challenges of every turn. Not everyone agrees with the strategy, but by the grace of God, the craft will get everyone to safety. Many, of it, uh, many adventures to be had along the way. So that was my little picture of how I see things at the moment. You may think, oh, well, I might as well switch off now. He hasn't got anything useful to say. However, um, you may relate to it, and maybe you, you're a person who identifies as being one with a paddle. Maybe you're somebody who's uh, in, with a life jacket just outside the, uh, the raft at the moment and need to be uh, sort of pulled back on board. But uh, be confident. The people who, um, who are paddling love you. They're, they're trying to get you there. They're trying to avoid all the dangers and the rocks and so on. So I think the call on us is to love rather than to judge. Isn't that always the way? 
to love rather than judge. Judging is, <clears throat> there's only actually one person ever qualified to judge, and that's the person who knows everything, which is probably not you or I, right? <laughs> the only person who knows everything there is to know is God. So let's leave judging to him. Loving is our job, what we've been asked to do, commanded to do. Um, you don't have to agree with everyone to be able to love. Choose the highest good of others, not because they are deserving, but because that simply is God's way. Um, yeah, so don't be drawn into criticism at times of change. Maybe things will be done differently. Um, choose the way of love. I was listening to, actually, Justin Welby was on the... On the uh, being interviewed on today a program when I was uh, driving to some fitness session or other this week and it was interesting that you made a point you had a bit of a tough job this week uh, if anybody has been following the you know trying to bring all the bishops to, together on one attitude and so on and one of the things he said which I thought was quite poignant he said families may disagree profoundly but it doesn't stop the members of that family from being a family um it's relationship. Born of the Spirit, we are related. We are sons and daughters of the same family. So even though disagreement and you know, profound differences may be there, we are family. We're in this boat together. Whether we're panicked along for the ride or excited, you know, we're there. Okay, well, let's turn to some of these scriptures that we've been looking at. The, the wedding in Cana that Jesus and his disciples were at, and of course, importantly, the mother of Jesus, Mary, was at. I want to present to you, first of all, a problem. What we constantly see, and perhaps I'll go back to the Today program, uh, is there's a constant barrage of news which is not particularly positive. Let's face it. We get a regular diet of bad news stories, whether it's the NHS or austerity measures, or ISIS, or terrorism. Um, then we pick up uh, the local paper just to be encouraged, and then we get stabbings and you know, thefts, and we get reminded about, uh, this time of year, about um, you know, obesity and health problems and you know, diabetes and dementia, and I don't know. Uh, it's not really a, a lovely scenario to look at, whether it's national news, international news, or local news. But what I want to say to you is it, it's very distorted. It's very edited. The edited lowlights, I suppose, we tend to get from the press. There are lots and lots and lots of good news stories. I was with my brother. Uh, I've got a twin brother, actually, 45 minutes older than me, but a good four inches taller. Um, but he, um, he works in Bolivia. And uh, I was there a couple of years ago. And I was just reminded when he was here a few days ago of going to a graduation. And three of the boys graduating from that uh, high school in Bolivia, when they were nine or ten, were street kids, sniffing glue with a life expectancy of 18. They were now 18, graduating from high school and going on to university. And I thought, well, this is a good news story, but who's telling this story? No, who's telling? It's just one little thing. You know, my brother's been out in Bolivia now 26 years working with street kids, and there are highs and lows. There are uh, times where it's it's very sad, and there are uh, times when there's tremendous changes going on in their lives. So we've got a problem of distortion. It's the lenses we're looking through at any situation, at the world. Perhaps also, I might say, the lens we're looking through when we look at ourselves. How do we see ourselves? Do we see ourselves through the lens of our history, you know, at the stories of the things that have happened to us, the kind of upbringing we had, our beginnings, if you like? It's easy to look at ourselves that way and say, well, I, I'm, I was an immigrant, or I'm, I didn't grow up with my dad, or I had a motherless family or I'm on a low income, or I was abused, or I was bullied, or I had poor school results. And maybe all those things are true. They are part of your story. 
But do they have to define who you are in the present? That's my question. Mary, in the story that we know, mother of Jesus, grew up in occupied Palestine. The Romans were in charge. There was poverty. Um, and the Romans were not nice people, generally speaking. There was plenty of extortion, prejudice, injustice. And of course, Mary had had a child, seemingly out of wedlock. Um, there was that question mark of Jesus' legitimacy as far as the, the, the eyes of the world were concerned, right? So, so Mary had every reason to see herself in a pretty negative light. Things weren't great. But you may remember that before Jesus was actually born, before she was uh, even, it, it, the child was even conceived, she had a visit from an angel of God who told her who she was. The Father in heaven told her who she was, told her she was favored, that she was beloved, that she was be, to be blessed. And she responds with that beautiful prayer that we call in the Anglican church, the Magnificat, where she just glorifies God and accepts that she has been chosen by God, not by any virtue of her own or any sort of qualifications, but she's just, that's what she's been called to do. And she just graciously accepts it and responds to God with thanksgiving. She knew who was with her. It didn't change any of her circumstances. She wasn't suddenly lifted out of Roman-occupied Palestine or poverty. But it did change her attitude and her world view and indeed her actions. And so we see her at this point. Jesus has obviously grown up. He's 30 years old now. And they're at this wedding, a very ordinary occasion. How many have been to weddings this year? Have you? This year? Oh, not this year. Last year. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Haven't had much of this year to go to weddings yet. Yeah. Okay, well, most of us have probably been to a wedding or, or two in the last five years or so. So they're very special occasions, but they are things that happen as part of our normal culture and so on. There was a, a bit of a problem. The wine had run out. Okay? Um, and it seems, in the grand scheme of things, that the wine running out is not the biggest problem going on in the world, to be honest. Don't you think? It is at that point in time for the particular person in charge of hospitality at the wedding. And I love the way this happens. Mary notices the need. She's sensitive to the small things that are going on. And she simply brings it to Jesus' attention, says they've run out of wine. And then completely leaves it with Jesus doesn't tell him, I think you should do it like this. I think you should solve the problem like that. I sometimes think this is quite a good picture of prayer. <clears throat> Simply bring the need to Jesus and then leave it with him. Sometimes we come with our suggestions about how he should fix it. You know, Maybe prayers ought to be a lot shorter. Uh, just leaving Jesus to get on with it. We just bring the need to him. Anyway, that's another sermon perhaps at another time. But she brings Jesus the problem. And so <clears throat> she goes with this trusting attitude, doesn't she? Um, and she says to the servants, and this is the, ele the element where we know she trusts Jesus, says, do whatever he tells you. She has no idea what, what he's going to tell them, but he says, do whatever he tells you. He knew the character of God. And we look at uh, that psalm that we read, Psalm 36, and we see, you know, his love his generosity and it, there's all these superlatives you know his faithfulness is like the mountains his justice is solid his everything's firm and he believe she believes in the character of the one that she knows and that's what makes the difference uh, i've got five kids and i used to play uh, this game with them when they were on the uh, stairs you know how a three or four year old um they love to be quite daring, you know, and they stand up on the fifth or sixth stair and then leap off, you know. I'm um, sure if all of you who've had small children know this feeling. And, and you just say to them, jump, and they, you know, they fly off the, the stairs and you catch them and they laugh and, you know, it's all, all very safe. 
Um, but let me say this to you. I have not yet had any of my children at that point in their lives when I've said, jump, go, ooh, I don't know. Let's have a look at the distance, um, the angle, the elevation, the wind direction. Uh, let's scientifically figure out whether this is really safe to do. None of them ever did that. Have you noticed? They, why do they jump then? Why do they trust me? They trust because they know the character of the one who said jump. Simple as that, isn't it? They trust the character of the one who said jump. It's a knowing that is not a knowing of the scientific you know, possibilities, probabilities, and so on of being safe if I jump. It's knowing the character of the one who says jump. This is why it's so important for us to build relationship with the one who has the character that we've just had described to us in Psalm 36. Because if we're confident in his character, when he says, jump, go, do, we're not going to be too worried about it. Am I right? Okay, so, um, so who are we listening to to get our sense of identity? Most of you will recall the story of Moses. Pretty famous story. He was from a persecuted minority, from the Hebrew people who at the time were slaves. To escape death, he was hidden by his mother in the reeds in a basket for a f only when he was a few months old. Very vulnerable. Amazingly, he was rescued by Pharaoh's daughter and ended up being brought up in the palace. But his heart, all the way along in his growing up, was with his people, with the, with the Hebrews. His identity was as a Hebrew. And one day he intervenes in a, in a dispute or in a, a, a time when a, an Egyptian is abusing a fellow Hebrew, and it ends up with the Egyptian being killed. Moses was trying to defend the slave, and it ended up with the Egyptian dead. He gets terribly afraid of what might happen to him as a consequence, runs away, ends up somewhere out in the desert, works for a sheep herder in um, Midian, marries his daughter, and he's kind of looking after sheep in the middle of the desert in obscurity. You know, he's kind of got a new identity, sheep herder in, you know, in the desert. And then sometime later, we know he meets God in the burning bush incident, and God speaks to him and calls him to go to Egypt and lead the Hebrew slaves into freedom. To put it mildly, Moses is reluctant to go. And what does he say? What does he list as his reasons for not going? Oh, I can't speak. Anything else? You remember? He goes into quite a castle. He says, who am I that I should go? Send someone else. You know, he's got every reason going why it shouldn't be him. So what I'm saying here is distortion again. He's full of his, his shortcomings. I'm not qualified. I've failed. I blew it in the past. I don't have what it takes. I'm, far, I'm too far away. Why should anyone listen to me? Has anybody ever heard that sort of thing coming out of your own mouth when you're challenged? You know, we like to, oh no, not me, disqualify ourselves, you know, by our, our own perhaps failures or our perceived failures, our story, and we try and disqualify ourselves from active service in some way, full of our shortcomings. What's God's answer to Moses' question, who am I that I should go? remember yeah pretty much he says I am with you I am with you seems a funny answer really doesn't it he doesn't sort of say well Moses you're, you're quite a good bloke and you're this and you know, he doesn't go into it he says I am with you in other words it's almost as if he's saying Moses actually doesn't really matter who you are or your story or all the things that you feel you failed at I'm calling you and I will be with you as I said I've got a twin brother and uh, I, I got I wasn't very big when I was uh, 
you know, um, growing up. Uh, but my brother was. He was always big. And back in those days in London, you know, there were some types of out who liked to beat up people me, like me with my long hair and um, hippie looks in those days. Yes, it's hard to imagine, but there you go. Um, but I'll tell you what, when I was walking with my brother, I felt confident. Nothing, it didn't change me, did it? But it mattered who was with me. <laughs> I felt a bit more confident because I was with this big brother. It made a big difference to me. So it matters who is with you, doesn't it? It changes the way you, you perceive things if you know who is with you. So if you know that the, the maker of the entire universe who has all power and all knowledge and all <laughs> everything is with you, it ought to give us a little bit of a boost. Yeah? Um, good. Glad we got that established. Um, so here we are, Mary, back to the wedding again, sorry. Um, she knows who is with her. She knows her son is the son of God. She knows who is with her. That's why she's confident, even in the small fry of things like wine running out. She knows that she can have confidence in her son. After Jesus, Jesus rises from the dead and tells his disciples what their job is, do you remember what that was? Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Just a you know, little thing to be getting along with you know, for the next few years. We're still doing it. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Do you think they felt supremely qualified? You think, oh yeah, okay, we'll do that. And what did he say to give them confidence? And I will be with you. I will be with you. Again, there's that phrase, I will be with you. That's enough. I will be with you. So don't worry about your story, your qualifications, your failures, or your perceived lack of resources. The God of the entire universe is with you. In three occasions in my life that I, you know, I could, it's not only three, but three big ones that I can mention in my life, I have noticed God with me in a real way. When I was 21, I was on my motorbike going to work, and a car did a right-hand turn in front of me. You know, just like those adverts, think bike, you know, but they didn't. So um, I hit the car, went straight over the top of the, the, um, the roof of the car, left half of my right leg, the other side of the car, literally four inches of my femur didn't come with me. Um, and uh, I, and my passenger <laughs> was further down the road than I was, and we were scraped up off the road and taken to the hospital. I was told... 15 more minutes, that would have been it, over. Um, nearly lost my, uh, my right leg, they were going to amputate it, and you know, it was, it was not a pleasant experience really. But the one thing I can say about that is God was with me. I had just become a Christian about a few months before that, and somehow the, the peace of God was on me in the hospital. Uh, it didn't seem like, right, I'm so angry with that woman for doing that. It just seemed like this has happened. Now what? And I learned that there's a difference in life. There's two questions that we can ask. We can either go, why, why, why? Why me, God? Why? It's not fair. How many people do we meet in life, maybe we are one of them, <laughs> that's saying why when something surprising, seemingly unfair happens? We go, why? And we shake our fist at the Almighty and the why question really gets a very decent answer, to be honest. You don't really know. Stuff happens. It just does. It's how we respond to what happens that really matters, isn't it? So, you know, I had an early start, you know, in, in understanding that stop asking the question why, which may never get the decent answer this side of heaven, <coughs> and start asking what now? What now? What can I do now? In hospital, that was my mission field. Started to, to uh, you know, relate to the people in the hospital. Started to share 
with the people in the hospital. I was there four months. I had a good, decent time to do it. Okay. Then later on, and some of you know, and I don't want to bore you with all this, but you know, I was married for 28 years. My wife left. And I was in YWAM, in Youth with a Mission, 28 years. We'd served in South America. It was a crash of another sort. Absolutely rip, ripped me apart. Had not seen it coming in a million years. And I remember driving down the road in, from Harpenden towards Luton. I probably didn't keep the speed limit. Um, and I stopped in a, in a lay-by. And I screamed my head off. And I probably turned the, the air blue. Wasn't very nice what I was saying. I was quite upset, to put it mildly. I just, just didn't know what to do. And I didn't get the sense of a God going, oh, dear, oh dear, what terrible language coming out of David's mouth. I don't think it was very new to God. You know? I think he's heard it all before. But what I did sense was God is close to the brokenhearted. God is close to the brokenhearted. He was there in my mess, in my boat, in my raft at the time. You know, he's there with me. He wasn't, you know, well, you really blew it, didn't you? You know, he was with me, still with me. And, you know, then, you know, I started as a, living as a single parent for the next six years and starting to learn to respond to that change of career. I had to step out of YWAM and do some other, um, train as a fitness instructor at 50. Um, which was interesting, <laughs> and it's been wonderful. New mission field. Anyway, there's lots of stories I could tell. And then, some years later, and I just mentioned this, another devastating crash, um, which happened about three and a half years ago. I get a call at work to say that my 21-year-old daughter has been killed in a crash in Northern Ireland. And the temptation is to want to go and say, God, why? She was a beautiful, active, loved God, just finished second year at university, just going on holiday. And she, I put her in, uh, in the car, you know, t sorry, I'd taken her in the car to Luton Airport to fly to Belfast in the morning. And she said, pray for me, Dad. This is a really important week. I, I, I've been talking to these uh, fellow students of mine at university, and I think this is going to be a week that's going to be really important for them. It certainly was, but not in the way you'd expect. Changed their lives, changed our lives irrevocably. But you know, it's no good my standing here going, why, God? Believe you me, there were times where I wanted to say why, and I, I've asked that question, but you don't stay there forever, do you? You say, now what? She finished her race at 21. Maybe I'll finish my race a little bit later. Well, I already will. I'm more than 21. But, uh, but understand that the question why is not going to lead you necessarily to the answers you need. What now? Now what, God? Now what can I do? given the circumstances that I find myself in. And I see this with Paul. You know, sometimes Paul, you know, is shipwrecked. Do you think that was kind of the plan? I don't know. It happened. Sometimes he was imprisoned and flogged. Do you think that was, you know, God's plan? I mean, we sometimes, you know, get a bit, well, you know, inshallah, you know, almost. You know, is that is God's will? I don't know. I don't know how to answer some of these questions. But what I do know is that Paul, when he was in prison, decided to worship God. Job, when he lost everything, decided, you know, I came into this world with nothing. I leave it with nothing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I know that it's how we respond to the stuff that happens in life which determines the kind of followers we are. Mary didn't sit there feeling a victim. You know, I've had this baby and everybody thinks it was Ill illegitimate. And blah, 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 you know, she got on with trusting the one in whom, you know, she, 
who'd given her everything, who'd spoken over her life, you are favored, you are blessed. She believed it and acted accordingly. So I don't know if you're brokenhearted today over, me, over other, you've had another story. I've had this story, you've got another story, and we've had tragedies and triumphs, and we've had a bit of everything, haven't we? But today is the day where we, we can decide, am I going to be a victim of my past, or am I going to walk in the freedom to choose to be the person God has called me to be today? God made it clear to me when I was in hospital, actually, back when I was 21, that he wanted me to go to Bolivia and make disciples. Bolivia. And I started down my, my Moses track, you know, but I failed my French O-level, you know. I'm not good at languages, God. Don't send me to South America. They speak Spanish there. I don't, you know, I'm not good at languages. I've never been on a plane before, and I hadn't. I'm a civil servant with no savings, I was. I've got a wife and child. Um, you know, I'm in an Anglican church in Barnet, and they don't, they're a bit skeptical of this call of God to Bolivia, to be honest. And, you know, I, I had my lined up excuses. Um, but I said yes, because I knew enough about God, and it wasn't a lot, to know that I could trust him. And that's perhaps all you do need. You don't have all the answers. Well, maybe you do. I don't know. But I don't have all the answers yet um, by a very long way. In fact, the longer I live, the less I know. Um, but the, the more I'm sure that God can be trusted, that God is who he says he is. And therefore, I am who he says I am. If you go away with nothing else, just remember that today. God is who he says he is, and you are who he says he is. Because that will make all the difference. So, yes, I went to Bolivia. I was there for 11 years. And as a result, we saw some Bolivia, the first generation of Bolivian missionaries going to India, going to Afghanistan. My... Um, my brother came out just to help me for a year. He forgot to leave. He's been there 26 years. And uh, he started a ministry with street children, as I was referring to earlier. You know, sometimes saying yes to God has, has some lasting consequences, doesn't it? You are who God says you are. So don't be a victim of your past life experiences. Let God determine who you are. Jesus, at the end of the day, himself was born into poverty, son of a carpenter by trade, in the Roman-occupied Palestine, treated as an upstart, as a blasphemer, an imposter. He was misunderstood, mocked, tortured, and eventually killed. Yet he walked in the truth of who he really was, in his identity as a son of God. Yes, with humility, but secure in who he was. So we better get back to Mary at the wedding. Are we all right for time? Okay. Okay. Carry on for a second or two. Um, she sees a need. The wine ran out. She cares about the potential social embarrassment for the family, brings the concern to Jesus, and then leaves it with him. Isn't that beautifully simple? Jesus uses what there is in the situation. Now, I can refer back to Moses on this one as well. Moses was called, and then... God says, and he's already saying, I, I'm eminently not qualified. And God said, asks him a question. Do you remember what he says? What do you have in your hands? He says, what do you have in your hand? And he has a stick. And he thinks, great, a stick. That's what I have in my hand. <laughs> Doesn't look like a lot. And Jesus says, right, put that down on the ground. And it becomes a snake, and then it, you know, he holds it over water, and it turns to blood. And there's various signs that God gives him. He says, you may only have a stick, Moses, but what I can do with that, because I'm with you, makes all the difference. So stop, you know, it's a stick. Okay. And it was the stick he held over the Red Sea, but it was the symbol of God being with him. That's the important bit, not whether it was mahogany or oak or, you know, it, it was a stick. It was a symbol of God being with him. What do you have in your hand? I don't know. Jesus had available some stone jars. So he says to the, the, the servants, fill them up. And uh, 
That's interesting as well. They were for ceremonial washing and things like that, actually. But Jesus draws no attention to himself. The servants take the wine to the best man, and he declares it as the best wine going. Only the servants really knew what happened. He didn't, you know, it was... That was the first miracle. I think it's a strange miracle in many ways. It wasn't a healing or a rising from the dead. It was changing water into wine. So, um, and I'll finish with this little bit here. Back to Cana again. He saves the best till last. And this may be where God wants to touch you this morning. You can spend too much time regretting the past or blaming others for the life you have. Like I could have, you know, well, that was that lady who drove out in front of me that ruined my life or my wife leaving that wrecked my life or my daughter's crash, you know, that, that altered my life. So I'm a victim. You could do that if you like, but if you stay there in that victim mentality of regret, you're missing the best that God has for you today. The past, yes, you can't deny it or change it or it is part of your story but God is the God of new things he brings beauty out of ashes beauty from ashes I was walking in Tenerife once and there's lots of volcanoes there and, and you see real blackened earth and I remember walking there and seeing flowers growing in the, uh, in the ashes and I thought God, that is literally beauty from ashes isn't it and it was quite symbolic really but down the road you know I, I now see that God, by the grace of God being with me, I've been able to start a, a business as a personal trainer, and I, I've, I've, see, I've seen over 600 mums and their babies doing buggy fitness. You know? <laughs> and I think this is my mission field. 1,300 people in the gym where I work. It's my mission field. All these PT clients that I have all over, you know, actually quite a few in Bushmead, actually, um, are these people that I disciple. You remember Jesus disciples people who aren't Christians. Do you realize that you're not called to disciple people who are? Or at least you don't have to start there. You, when, the peop, when Jesus chose people, they weren't Christians. <laughs> they were, you know, just people that were okay to follow him. So start with who you've got around you. That is your mission field. You don't have to go to Bolivia to have a mission field. Yeah? Um, and how, first of all, you might have to forgive one or two people to set yourself free to live in the present. Otherwise, you're anchored to the past. I did have to forgive a woman for making a mistake with her car. I did have to forgive my ex-wife. So much so that she spent time this year for Christmas with us, with her partner. It's unusual. But God has called us to love. And it says love our enemies, pray for those who persecute you. There isn't a specific one about ex-wives that I know of. Um, but I think we get the gist of it. God has called us to love everyone, even if it's complicated. And we have to ask for God for wisdom to know how to do that. The beauty from ashes I have is, is Liz. Some of you met my wife, Liz, who I married three years ago. Is, is, you know, God can do a new thing. He's restored my heart, my life, my children's lives you know, through, through a beautiful relationship there too. It's incredible. So you may have to judge. You may have, sorry, you may have to forgive. Stop judging. Stop judging. It's God's job. And, uh, you know, and then choose the way of love. I think we're going to have to pray here because otherwise I'll be here all morning, won't I? So, Father, our, our journey is completely known to you. There's nothing about our story that is a surprise to you. The stuff that we've done, the mistakes we've made, the abuses we suffered, the insults that we had, the incidents like crashes that we've had in, in like in my life um, we've all had them Lord but each of our stories is different and unique but I ask you Father that today you 
do a new thing in our hearts and just remind us that you are with us. You are with us. And you are everything that we need. And we need not be afraid because you are with us. We need not be anxious in this raft going down this white water journey because you are with us. We don't have to be concerned about the people with the paddles and are they competent enough or, or all this. You are with us. And you've also said to us that, you know, what do we have in our hand? It's enough. It might only be a stick. <laughs> it might only be relatively insignificant. But what you've given us is what we start with. The people around us, the energy that we've got, whatever. And enable us, Lord, to make the choice day by day to choose the way of love. To choose the way of love. Even with people that have offended us, hurt us, affected us in some way. To choose the way of love. As Jesus chose the way of love with his tormentors. And decided to forgive them even because they didn't know what they were doing. Father, thank you for the chance to share our journeys this morning together and as we go out from this place that we'd be a little bit more like Mary. Amen.